Thank you so much for making the time to meet with us, guys. Uh, maybe even before talking about uh, Kepia and what you do, let's start with how did you guys meet? Want to take it? Yeah, I'll take <laughs> that one. Um, we go to the, to the same church um, and we met at church um, through a few friends and all the other partners of, uh, of the company actually go to the same church. After the church Sunday service, we always get together and discuss lots of things. We all come from different backgrounds. I come from oil business. He comes from business development. We got guys in agriculture. We all add um, some common ideas that we need to do something. And uh, let's, uh, let's, let's go to farming because some of us have an history of farming. My family in the past, even before the war. So we always had that kind of conversation. So one day we just thought, hey, let's, let's, let's just start something, you know? So, so what kind of farm are we gonna start? And then we start seeing the problems farmers face, you know? And uh, we, we all live and work in, 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 in the capital, Luanda, uh, but we always love going off-roading and going uh, far. So we had to get also that together. So we start seeing what problems come and we see that Farmers had lots of issues regarding uh, training the products that they have. They are producing, they don't know exactly where they're going to sell it. And, um, and logistics is just hell because you guys know how the roads are and you're going to see a bit more. Um, but yeah, we, 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 we start seeing that regardless if they were like small or the farmers or big farmers, they all faced um, pretty much the same issues. So, even if we wanted to create like a more like high tech kind of farm, we would still face the same issues. And we, 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 we start seeing that, you know, especially, and this is probably our focus, the small order farmers, you know, and we could see that the, the situation is really bad, you know, uh, for them, you know, and we, every time we go and when we travel, and even this weekend, we went like traveling 1,500 kilometers going and returning. And you see that you go to a market and you see that they're there trying to sell the products. And the way, and this like was screaming to us uh, in a silent voice, you know. And when it, let's before actually going to farming, what can we do to help the farmers, you know? And if we can make something out of that, you know, I think I think we're good. We got a, a good way to start. So then we can farm. Yeah, then <laughs> we can go and we can farm, you know. <laughs> go back it. So in a nutshell, what does Kepia do? Uh, take that one. Uh, yeah, it can be. Well, Kepia brings people together. Uh, the, the, the biggest problem is that buyers don't know where to buy, sellers don't know to whom to sell, and transporters who should be in the middle don't have any freight. So what we do is we connect them all. Uh, so producers, they can do whatever, well, well, what they like to do, which is to produce. Uh, and buyers can have a free market with better prices, better products. Uh, and information about all of them. So in a nutshell is, is this. Uh, the issue is when we have technology uh, and we are talking about agriculture and we are talking about rural areas, we have a problem that is uh, how can we bring technology if they barely can read or, or write. So we found a way which is bringing young people who are digital native and if you put a phone on their hands they know what to do everything and they have a Facebook account and Instagram and uh, so they're the perfect bridge between that info excluded farmer and uh, a digital platform so this is what KP is all about and I actually love that you brought that up because um, I was seeing that you have yeah. like Thank you. You have four uh, major actors, I would say. Um, there's the producers, uh -huh. there are the, the buyers, the, the off-takers, right? No, the, the transporters. The, yeah, exactly. So we, we got the producers, which is the farmers, yes. the starting point. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we have the buyers, people that are buying the products, especially if there are companies like uh, supermarkets, restaurants, and all that really require those products. And most of them, they're importing because we import pretty much everything that we eat. Yeah. Um, and then you have the transporter to connect them both. But as a way to help out the farmers comes the aggregator. Yeah. So we will be the one actually um, helping out the farmer, you know, to interact 
kind of a translator, both in terms of technology, but also just opening himself to this new method of, of working. How do you source for said aggregators, or in fact for farmers, for the transporters and the buyers? So pretty much you need to see someone that the farmer trusts. You know? So it would be ideally a young person from the same village, from the same area, uh, same ethnic background, that understands the local language because we have several uh, languages in Angola. So this is the way that we go when we actually travel and all the, the, the meetings that we've been doing so far. We, we tend to look for them, you know, the, the, the youngsters, you know, that are in the village, especially if he has a, a phone on his hand. Okay, that should be uh, a target, you know. Um, but it can be just anyone that the farmer trusts, it can be his son, his nephew. Uh, but what we require is for him not just to help just one farmer, for him to help uh, a group, or probably a small village. And so that's uh, how we go to them. <laughs> so you're basically like on the road and you support, you support someone with a phone and you're like, hey, do you want yeah, to be an Yeah, that's actually the hard and most expensive part yeah. of it. And that's why this is one of the parts that we are going a bit slower at. So mm -hmm. when we try to get as much support as we can, because this is actually the heaviest in terms of investment. Because you actually need to go there and you just don't give him a t-shirt and a cap. No, you need to embark him and you need to you know uh, put him on board of the concept you need to train him um, for him to be the representative of this uh, ecosystem because that's what we're trying to create you know it's not just a middleman because we really don't want to recreate the middleman and because the middleman um, is actually one of the problems that we're trying to solve uh, what happens here and probably in some other parts of Africa as well is that you got the farmer and, and you got the people buying and then you got people who interact and move around and most of them those are the guys who are going to crush the farmer especially the smallholder farmer if they go to a large one they don't even need them but they go to the farmers and they try to acquire the product some of them they're not very ethical uh, in terms of negotiating price in terms of just getting it out of them some of them they just buy on credit they just count because people in, in the province, they're, they're very trustworthy, they're very like open and um, even with the whole war situation, you still have a lot of people who have, you know, and they're also willing and they, they need it. So if someone comes and tries to offtake their product, I'm going to do that. What they, do, what they normally do is they pay up front, they get the product and they take it away. Next time he does it again, they say, okay, this guy is our savior. Next, the third time, oh, I need to take it, but I can't, I just pay you half. The next time he takes, he doesn't come back. You know, so this is the thing we want to to help them to have the solution from their own side. You know, uh, so that's why you want someone that trusts and understands the situation within the, the the area that they live in. So only a person that lives there, you know, because you know we're in Africa. It's a face to face uh, mm -hmm. relationship, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, they would not, you know, uh, repeat the problems of. Uh, of the middleman that we're trying to get. Not all middlemen are, you know, unethical, but you know, when when you when That's people what their reputation is when, yeah, yeah. <laughs> when you find someone that doesn't, you know, they don't have the same, um, you know, academic background and all that, they will probably tra take advantage of that. So we're trying to cut that in a way. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. I think you're the first platform like this in Angola. Yeah, we, 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 yeah, we started. A few others uh, also popped out um, in, in, the, in the, the past year or so. Uh, but re in regards to the focus on, the, on actually helping the farmer, uh, I think we are pretty much along on that. The other platforms are more trying to get the product here to export it, you know, in a more um, like, I, company business to business kind of, of way. Um, so they're not really, from what we analyze, so this, this is, well, this is uh, probably, uh, we have to assume they're, they're a bit new on the ones that we saw, but uh, as everybody's trying to do exports other than oil, I think they're gonna focus on that. So they go to the, to the big farmers that can have, because if you want to export, you need to have a certain level of quality and all that. Uh, so I think that is what makes us a bit different is that we're, 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 we're going to the hardest road. <laughs> I don't think that's probably, uh, you know, a bit crazy, but that's, we want to do something that makes a difference. 
how did you test it out in the beginning? How did you know that? How did you get a feel for, okay, this is going to work? Uh, so, first of all, we, we were thinking as farmers, you know, and how would, you know, if I have no means, if I'm staying in a, in a faraway province, 500 kilometers from any uh, town, you know, and if I didn't have a, a car or whatever, I'm producing, I don't have much means, what would be uh, a good starting point? Um, from the other end, we also write technology people, we understand the, 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 the profits of, of, of a marketplace, of the, the benefits that digital transformation can perform in pretty classical and traditional um, uh, segments uh, of the economy. So th it was a mix, you know, but we started with people who actually have them, you know, people that we know, farmers, okay, what happens if I would do this, you know, and people would look at us, yeah, that would be a dream, you know. What happens if you would only just need to concentrate yourself on producing the best mangoes in the market and don't worry about logistics, don't worry about selling that, coming to Luanda, facing all the issues, going to the big markets there, all the risks involved. What would be, you know, people would just, they start, you know, their eyes start, oh, that would be just great. I would really be a farmer in, in, in the perspective. So. I've spoken with family members that are still struggling with that. Um, I still have some family that is still, you know, making their ways of farming. Uh, and that's what's, you know, pretty much, you know, a need that is very close to us. I would, I would and, say. and we had to endeavor through Deep Angola uh, to see farmers' reality. So because this is not about just creating a platform, which is the simplest part of it. It is about going to the field and understanding what's the need. And we then we use the pilot area to test it. So it's in Kwanza Sul, a province uh, like 300, 300 kilometers away from Luanda. And we started testing with them and shipping products here to, to Luanda and trying to fine tuning what we should uh, change in the platform. And um, that's how we, we came to, to the best solution that we could. Yeah, and we're still learning. It's, yeah. it's, it's a Always. learning process. Any, any, any situation, different farmer, a different uh, flow, it, it's going to require a realignment of, of, of the business model and the platform itself, you know, and we're still developing. It's going to be, um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's an challenge. organism it's that's going to grow and, and, and try to adapt as much as possible. We also uh, went to other countries, we went to Kenya as well to understand the reality there. Um, we could see stuff that we could apply and stuff that we really cannot, you know, just to and, 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 but, and that made it in such a way that we could actually get the best from experiences elsewhere and try to see what would work here, you know, how to make it. There's, there's lots of companies and, and, and things like all that just go buy elsewhere and just try to apply it and by experience, by extensive experience, so that that does not work. Even if you were importing from, a, from another African country, and people try to look at Africa as one country, but we're, we're, we're quite different from each other. We're really diverse. Um, one of the things that we can analyze when we went to Kenya, well, the level of, of um, uh, academic level of a farmer in Kenya is, is uh, much better than one here, you know? Uh, when we weren't there, I saw a farmer going with his phone, buying fertilizers with his phone and the guy in the company with a, with a, with a tablet, charging that and get his receipt by a text message. This is a dream, but this is the kind of dream we want to aim for, you know? But we need to, you know, to start from really, uh, from, from basics to get to that point. And on a day-to-day -day basis, how uh, directly do you interact with the different actors? Uh, it's quite permanent. We have, uh, um, especially with the aggregators, uh, we have you now use a lot of WhatsApp-based thing, but the app itself, this is what we do outside if you want to manage so, some of the farmers that we have. At first, they need a more direct contact. Before you kind of prepare them, no. The purpose here is that you don't really need to see us. If you trust us, you're going to trust this. And then you can just use this path, you know. Um, so at this stage, uh, we, we still need to have a bit of more physical presence. Uh, but we, the purpose now is the more and more uh, these farmers and these aggregators, they go through the platform once they uh, 
start trusting it more. <laughs> so just to make it very tangible for someone that is listening to this, so there are farmers that are producing and then you find the aggregators, the local youth that have, uh, that are open to using technology. And now what, how does the actual process look for this aggregator? What does he have to type in and then what happens? Okay, so the aggregator, he registers the producers to whom he's related. And then he submits their productions, uh, both current as future and if he submits, the longest we have for a product, the best for him, because he can sell it in advance, so it lowers the risk. Uh, so he just submits, add product, he says from whom is that product, quantities, uh, predicted date of harvest, and the price, selling price. That is information is kept on the platform. In the other hand, buyers, which can be restaurants, supermarkets, we have many different uh, types of buyers, what they do on the platform is they submit their needs. So this is not an ads uh, platform where you can browse what's available. No, what you do is you submit your needs and the platform crosses that information looking for perfect matches. So a perfect match can, if, if I need, for example, three tons of tomato, but two uh, producers, each one of them has 1.5, so it will solve my solution. And I don't even have to know that's coming from two different uh, producers. Uh, once I confirm that I want to buy that, the transporter comes into action. So he goes and picks it up and brings it to deliver to, to the buyer. So that's how it works. And the buyer submits uh, his need for product, quantity, and also the uh, desired price? And the yes, time? he puts a, a, his target price. Okay. So the, the maximum price is willing to pay and the platform crosses because if there's any producer over that price, it will not show him that product, but it will tell to the producer there's someone who would buy if you had a lower price. Mm -hmm. And do you set the rates that the aggregators are earning and that the um, logistics companies are earning or how does that work? Like how, do the, how does the cake Basically, how does it get Shared. split? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, aggregators, they split the, the commissions with us. So we have uh, an amount uh, for us and an amount for them. Uh, transporters, they bid for the transports. In this phase, uh, you know, at this moment, we, we thought it's the best way because prices can vary a lot. Um, what we are going to do is we, we are learning patterns on pricing. So in the near future, then we'll, the platform will tell the prices and not the transporters. But nowadays, we, we use the bidding uh, well, way. Yeah, pr proposing the prices just to make sure that by historical uh, behavior mark, considering the seasonality of certain products, to have some kind of reference. So we're trying to also put that so it's easier for them to prepare themselves. You know, Otherwise, the producers are going to say, I'm going to count that, that month. I'm going to sell it at 740 when he gets there, he can't even get 500. So uh, we, we're trying to also uh, do something that we don't do much here in Angola is anticipate, you know, prepare, plan. Uh, so if you're producing now, if you want to produce now, to have the most information as possible for you to have some kind of, uh, you know, planning to see if it's going to be profitable or not. If the product you're trying to plan is going to be, is going to be ends meet. Because when we sometimes we were going talking to farmers a farmer you know he he, he loves what he does in any farmers and we we're cr kind of crazy <laughs> people because some here this just the joy of seeing it you know grow and they think of money uh, at a later stage and some of them they, they they understand that there's an expression here is that you know being a farmer is uh, uh it's getting poorer while you smile you know and, but we try to keep them smiling and not getting poorer. And, and the anticipation goes also for the buyer, also the buyer. If he goes here today, I want to buy something here because I want to cook for tomorrow. Of course, the price is going to be, it's going to be, uh, the, the, the bargaining power is going to decrease. So if they um, start to plan out, you know, their needs on one side and what they're going to produce on the other side. And also if we add this market index reference, that we're going to collect to have data-driven uh, decision-making. So they're going to start seeing that, okay, 
we can have even the, the patterns of a price. We understand that given certain times of the year, certain product was going to be up. We know that here in Luanda, mango season is going to start. But we were in Malangi, which is 500, 400 kilometers from here, and we saw mangoes everywhere. <laughs> so market, you know, you know, supply and demand. So we're trying to not, you know, um, control the market, but put the information there for them to operate freely. So we, we, we want the, the free market to, to operate. At this stage, we kind of, you know, taking them by hand, but we want them to use the, the platform, the ecosystem, and, you know, and this, the situation goes. But today, they don't have that in, in, in perspective. They don't have, some of them, they try, they create WhatsApp groups with 250 members or whatever. But still, it's limited, you know, because you, you, it's just doing that is just this, it's just to amplify a bit more of what they already do. But you, okay, you have 250 or 200 groups that you go and try to sell your stuff. If you can use Facebook, you can always use those apps or those social networks. But they don't have this marketplace in mind. And um, we are trying to see, first of all, trying to put them at equal terms in terms of going to the market. So a farmer can have the same kind of standing in terms of uh, competitiveness when he goes to the market. Because uh, today, if you're a buyer, you have the money and you have the knowledge, you crush them. And what happens is that when, when a buyer or a middleman crushes, they're, 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 they're smiling because they're making a good deal, but they're just crushing farmers. I and mean, you don't have as much farmers as you used to have 30 years ago or 40 years ago. At the end of the day, they're just shooting their own foot. <laughs> and what happens is that we, we, we don't leave this import situation. You go to any uh, of these markets, try to go to the markets, and you're going to see a lot of tropical imported fruit. And come on, that's, uh, you know, and for, uh, it, it, it has become common since many years. And you're going to see mangoes coming from elsewhere. No, it's crazy. The best mangoes, best mangoes that I know, they're from here. The most sweet mangoes, the best. And, we should be exporting them, you know? Um, well, someone would probably say, nah, our mango is the best from the <laughs> I was going to say Kenya. I was going to say Kenya. <laughs> I, was, okay. I was waiting for that. Answer. So, I've been to Kenya. They really Have are you? sweet. They really are sweet. Have you tasted the apple mangoes? No, no. Oh, so okay, good. but you know there are different types of mangoes? Yes. Okay, so you're going to test our own. The, the best ones, you should have to wait till mid-December. And they're so sweet, and you know, they're so sweet. And then you have the other ones, the big ones, like see a mango this size, it's like a melon. And we have those, and they're sweet. Okay, I'm doing it right now. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, but this, this is us. They can carry that on a bike. Yeah, yeah, I think. Yeah, I'm gonna send you one. I have one question because you pointed to towards the role of the middleman currently and how your marketplace is also trying to solve that part of the problem. So, what is the actual difference for a farmer right now? How much more will they have of what they sell? Can you uh, quantify that? Will they have 50% um, more money? Or um, can, do you have numbers for that? How, how it makes a difference for the farmers currently, your model? Uh, well, it depends a lot. Uh, because today, what middlemen do, they, they crush them. Because they wait until the last minute. And either they buy it very cheap or product just goes to waste. Uh, and based on that, producers nowadays, they lose about 50% of their production, uh, both on price or quantity, uh, because they're really pushed up to the limit. If they can predict their uh, harvest and sell it in advance, so they can do it at normal market prices. So just to begin, we have those 50% increase. Uh, then if he's sure that he can sell what he produces, he will be able to produce more. That's what they have. They, another problem they face today is that they want to, to grow their, their fields because they ask, how am I going to sell this? So if you empower them, giving him the ability to sell at market prices and to grow more. So uh, I think the limit is the quantity of land he has. Okay, so it's mainly it's mainly a, a matter of predictability for the farmers yeah. of yeah. having a sure offtake. Yeah, it, it starts from there, but then you have more. It's uh, considering that we see here four players, but we're actually trying to build uh, a, a farming ecosystem. That if you're a farmer, what do you need? You need to you need to sell, but you also need to produce first of all. You need to produce with efficiency. So if you want to get a good price, it starts 
from the ground, you know, it starts from the field, it starts what fertilizer you're going to use, when you're going to plant, what you're going to do. So we're trying to bring that to the ecosystem. So um, other players in the market, people who sell fertilizers, who sell, who even rent out equipment, tractors and all that, but also the intelligence, you know, like uh, if you need to know um, how you feel and to predict what you're going to produce, the technology today can you know, show you so much more. And so we want to bring that as well. So we want to make sure that the farmer becomes a better farmer. First of all, he becomes a better farmer, better products. Uh, so when he goes to the market, he also has a good quality product with the best pricing. So he's in a better position. So uh, today uh, he, he's producing since as he, he learned from his father, grandfather, whatever. But we're trying to bring what today is only available to top farming companies with their own engineers and to actually create a way of bringing that same technology, that same um, data-driven you know, uh, decision-making, remote censoring to, you know, to see that you get the best crops, you know, the best yield for your uh, actor. And sometimes when you go in and we ask the farmers, uh, more or less uh, how much you're producing per hectare and he couldn't even answer I'm talking about the small little farmer they he start calculating ah, I'm two tons three tons and if you ask like uh, a Dutch farmer he's gonna tell you by the you know <laughs> by the grams of <laughs> coming there so and that's it you know if we're bringing that to him as well we, we're gonna help you there and then once you have the best thing possible you have the market here and you just concentrate on you know toiling the land how did you finance this venture? How, what did you have to do to create it? Well, up to now, everything has been done with our own resources. Uh, we're not going for a finance round. Um, we have some investors interested and we are now doing the romance uh, to, to be able to grow because uh, the growth needs investment and that's in the phase, in the phase where we are. Do you still recall your first deal, the first match that you created? Uh, yeah. What did that look like? Uh, rush. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, we got it, you know. <laughs> we got it, but then we need to run to make sure that it, it will happen from beginning to the end. <laughs> so being sure that the truck will go and monitoring what is that at the moment is, is will he deliver it on time? Uh, so it was, it was, it was funny, um, but it required a lot of uh, learning process. Yeah, we are, and are, we're I'm still doing it. I remember when we got to, to the buyer and he was looking at the product. No, you have to organize this in crates and this, you know, it, it comes with, with his uh, perspective. And so that's the first lessons that you get, you know, you need to acquire that information before you actually deliver, you know. And the, some of the presents, no, I'm not going to take that. I need this in this situation. So, and then we had to, okay, now we have this, what are we going to do? You know, we have to go and sell it elsewhere. Uh, but it was, it was still fun, you know? I don't, I don't think we make any money out of that. Probably we lost. The first one, we lost. <laughs> <laughs> but the farmer didn't. <laughs> That's good, you saved the farmer. <laughs> yeah. uh, he, was happy. he was happy, he was happy. So how did your second transaction look? Because I'm asking because so you just described or you at least you gave us a glimpse of what the first match looked like mm. and it's pretty much hand holding as you said and surprises and working through it then how did the second one look and, and at what point uh, were you able to say okay now we can somewhat trust that this could work automated on a platform yeah. or uh, or are you there yet also i wouldn't say the second but the third <laughs> But yeah, we, we learned a lot from the first, the second, and, and then on the third, we already applied everything we, we had learned. And then we, we, we had the conclusion, yeah, that this is going to work right now. Um, so we had to organize some logistical issues that we learned from the first two ones. We had to organize with some surprises that you're not counting with them. And so you need to quick fix it. Uh, so we, we, we then we had our lesson and, and the third one it was a good one so from now on it, it's steady yeah what, what we got from the first one was actually the farmer was trusting and the buyer was trusting so we got this both ends 
and the, the second and third is everything in between we need to you know make sure that we do it as faster better you know and anticipating as well from our side and and pretty much but as soon as we know okay the buyer knows that we we can get him a good product and the seller say we well, the, the seller will the farmer say okay these guys can can deliver they can you know offtake it and i see that's why that's why we were so happy okay these guys are good and now let's let's not make it profitable for us <laughs> not only for them <laughs> I have another question because many of the entrepreneurs we see are actually trying to impact the lives of farmers and and um, make help them make a better living. Um, and many of the startups or entrepreneurs that we meet with, they are in the capital cities. And of yeah. course, it's the, just the nature of our trip. So we are mostly in the capital cities and getting to speak to entrepreneurs there. But do you have any advice for people that work with farmers um, in remote areas? how they can make sure that in their business, in their platforms, that everything is working out. How do you support the farmers in using the technology or the aggregators? How do you, how do you manage it from Luanda while the actual operations of the, on the production side happening 300, 400 kilometers from here? Yeah, people you can trust. You know, first of all, every person that you interact, any aggregator, you need to do your kind of due diligence, say, okay, this guy will represent us in, in many ways. He's going to carry the brand, he's going to carry the name. So I think the advice that I would probably use, first of all, is, you know, we, we, we're getting the best people, you know, people are motivated, people who embark in this, uh, we're not just here for the money. Um, I think that to me would be the, the main thing to look for, you know, because if you're just bringing in people who's just recreating the situation that you have today so we need to bring people who want to be disruptive and helping the others uh, in the same way as we are trying so because we're not going to be here there everywhere we would like to we would really like to <laughs> and we're trying the best and every time we can but we need to know if this has to grow it needs to grow with other people that we're going to embark so people I think. did you ever have any challenges with the people you selected um, I, once, I, I think one of them was a, a positive turn, a bit negative, is that if the person gets excited as well of getting the deal it, and it doesn't go and, and works out the maths of the transportation and all that, it might, you know, it is happy as, you know, but at the end of the day, it wasn't profitable, you know, you can't do that, you need to think, you need to, if you're not sure, call and we'll see it and that's the thing you know it, you can you can go pretty easy you know turning like farmers do you know getting poorer smiling <laughs> we are sitting here in a lawyer's office yeah. um, you guys also have another company uh, in Europe a motorbike rental company and now you have this startup this venture how do you how do you manage all of these different projects Sorry, and actually, just uh, to add to that, are you doing this full time? No, no, yes. I'm not. He is. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm. I'm not. I'm. I, I work in the oil business. I work in an oil company for 16 years. So, most of the, all the jobs that you can get here is if you're connected to the oil industry. Um, but yeah, uh, the other the other partners as well. We have two going to be three, probably four by. January doing full time, uh, but this is, is how do you you leave your day job and start doing this? And and considering that Angola, it's uh, it's it's a very, you know, um, I would say trying a very politically correct word. It's challenging yeah. in every kind of way, and if you see all the um, the indexes of, of corruption and doing, doing business. business. We're always in a very low situation. So even for us in Goals, it's a risk. You know, you got your job, you got your day job, and you're, you're far better than even all your, 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 your countrymen. And you're trying to lose that safety to go to this. So this is how we, we, we got lots of partners. So we share risk among ourselves and we share time availability. But we've reached to a point that no, people need to go full time on this. So by order of craziness <laughs> <laughs> so you're the most crazy him there I, I think I one of them he's one of them <laughs> but yeah we, we follow a model and we do that with the company in portugal uh, one of it's about trusting and having the right people managing it 
So in Portugal, we both of us are here, but we have a partner there and he's the one running the company. And we totally trust in him. Sometimes he, we make a conference call or something to decide something, but it's everything in his hands. We just have the reports and all the indicators uh, through, through internet. And the same happens here. So we have already a few that are available to work full time in the company, uh, but we still have the support of those who are not, but it's about trusting and, and talking a lot. You, you touched upon the uh, ease of conducting business in Angola index <laughs> <laughs> or difficulty of conducting you business in there, Angola. <laughs> My question would be, what is your number one challenge in both your, your day job maybe or in, on the startup? I'm just curious, what do you think is the biggest challenge for someone wanting to start a business uh, here in Angola? I'm I'm going to I'm going to say it in my in my perspective then you can say yours because sometimes it's not the same it's just if you, if you use and, and I studied in Europe and all that so you're kind of use of this all organization that you have of things you know you count on things so you take things for granted and you take nothing for granted here nothing you know even the smallest things you know they they can fail terribly so you need to have your eye on everything eye on everything you know even I know I've got, I got my kids, I need to go to school, and I got my car, and if I got a flat tire, it's, it, it, it just crushes you because you don't have the same service as you have elsewhere that you can count and, and, and trust. Um, I, I take just my car and I give my key to a guy, and I, no, I gotta go on a Saturday morning, I go under the car, take the filter out, because if I don't do that, it's gonna happen, you gotta have some risks. And it happens a lot, you know, you, you just stop in the middle of nowhere in your car and you don't know where the problem. So it's just an example that you need to cover everything, you know? And, uh, and for me, that is, I, I, sometimes I talk with my wife, he's like, man, we need to be like project managers and I'm a project manager in the old business. And, and you, have, you have more complexity outside in your day life as you in Europe or in America probably, okay, you concentrate on your work because everything else is handled, you know, you, you know society is arranged. But here it's, it's far more complex outside of work. So you go to work to relax because things are a bit more organized, especially if it's, you know, uh, an international company and things tend to be a bit more organized in your oil business and all that. But you know, once you go there and just this morning, man, I had no water at home. And you tell that to someone in Europe, what? No water? You, you couldn't take a shower? No, I did take a shower. We do. You, got, you take a shower, of course, but not in the same perspective as you would. You know, and this happens, you know, and, and I consider myself, okay, I'm, 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 I'm very grateful. <laughs> I thank God every day for the job I had, the friends I have, and the openness in terms of business. So I'm, I'm, I'm in the, like in the 2% that is, should be, you know, in the, the, having all the situation solved, but still I need to fix, you know, the, the water. And this is not something that happens once a year. No, this is happening, it happens every week, you know, you don't have electricity. And we were in Malaysia outside in, in the bush and I had my wife sitting in Texas, you know, that we have no water today. And, oh man, and, and you think, and you're just juggling all this worse. To me, that would be it. I don't know about you, you know. After that, <laughs> okay. then you have two more problems, which is people. Having uh, skilled people here is, is very hard. So when you find someone who's skilled, you need to bring him over, but then you need to manage him because people get sick or it's raining, he's not going to work because he can't find a taxi or because the taxi today is the triple of the price because it's raining. So managing people is a big challenge. And after managing people, you have all the bureaucracy and issues because you just want to do something, yeah, but you need this license and the stamp over there, then you need to buy the, 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 the sheet paper for the line, the 25 line paper for whatever. So uh, there's still a very socialist mentality on complicating things when you just needed to do this and it's done. So you need all the ways in between. After that, I think you <laughs> we're good. <laughs> it, thank you for sharing. <laughs> Doesn't sound so easy. And at the same time, uh, it sounds like there is a lot of opportunity here to create 
service businesses for other businesses to conduct their business more easily? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, the, that's the good part. You know, when you have lots of problems, you can have lots of ideas to fix them. So it becomes also, there's, there's a lot of companies now trying to get that, you know, for example, if I want to handle a document, if I want to go and pay a bill, or that, there are already companies coming, they're creating this, you know, this opportunity. So people look into that and not just complain, oh, life is hard and we had these problems. It's just that. How, and that's what we're saying. This, now we're, we call it, we're in the middle of a crisis. The oil is down and we heavily depend on it. Uh, so we got lots of issues, even crime is, is, is going up and all that. But you still can see that you find ways to, you know, to create a business, you know, from those same problems that you, people are complaining about. So yeah, we just doing that, you know, <laughs> people are complaining that you can't get products uh, and, and you, we were trying to fix that. So if everything was fixed, more or less, as you have it probably in Europe, probably you wouldn't have those opportunities. I don't know, it's, uh, you know, <laughs> it's a philosophical <laughs> question. Also. Yeah, and just to touch on that, um, fixing problems, what was your, like both of you, your first um, realization that I could actually solve a problem in this environment? Uh, in, uh, the risk of sounding a very cliche, like being the change that you want to see. What was your first, uh, when was your first realization or making that choice? Yeah, my ideas come from my frustrations, you know, and I'm like, I get frustrated first and then, yeah, if, what, what if someone could fix this, you know, would be, and by fixing that, you would make money out of it. And, one, and then you start the creative process. Uh, so uh, that's my way of seeing it. So th there's issues. If, if, you, if you don't stop on the complaining part, you can, you can go elsewhere, you know. And when you cross that border, that's when the ma magic starts to happen, you know. It's th it doesn't go, but at least the dream of it starts to happen. I believe that there's a quote part of responsibility here. So when you, have, when you see an opportunity, you see that you have the means, you have the right people around you, you have opportunity to solve people's problem. So then it goes beyond and becomes your responsibility to do that. Uh, at least I see that from that point of view. Uh, I usually say nothing happens without a purpose. So if, if I got to this position, now I have the responsibility to hold, go and help all those people whose lives can be changed after that. I was going to ask you about your main driver for creating a startup, for creating a new business, because you're seasoned businessmen already, yeah. both of you. And, but I think that already answers my question. So my final question would be, if you could give an advice to a young Angolan today, what would that be? Only one advice. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> Knock yourself out. <laughs> Ah, good one. To, well, you see, a few weeks ago, there was this uh, riot in one of the biggest areas of Luanda. Because it was the unemployment. What was it? Yeah, people were unemployed. People were just yeah. uh, questioning about the, there's a lot of unemployment. So, uh, and we would say, well, I think I'm going there with, with something saying I have jobs. <laughs> I, need, I need aggregators, please. <laughs> so also, instead of complaining, uh, and Angolan people, they are very uh, entrepreneur. You just go outside and you see someone selling, someone cooking, someone doing something. So it's, it's a matter of perspective. And one of the issues is they're very closed on their horizons. So they don't know what's beyond. And if they saw, they would see an opportunity in something to do. So it's just go beyond don't look only what you have around because there are many plenty of opportunities around and they could just grab them let me follow up on this because i i, I agree uh, my question would be how does a young person selling something on the street how do they go beyond how 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 do they do that let me tell you an example there are a few kids that i know and someone asked me well us to do like an entrepreneurship workshop with them one day. And we did, so we met them and we still have contact with them. So uh, they got the idea of selling popcorns in front of schools. So then they thought, well, if we are selling popcorns in one school, we could sell popcorns in more schools. So they bought, well, they, they bought, no, they built small carts and they, they bought a few popcorns, 
very small popcorn machines and they would do popcorns all night and then send the carts to sell popcorns in two schools. I thought, no, this is working. So they built a third car and they found someone else to bring that car to a third school. So I remember then I went on vacations. When I came back, they called me, come here. So I said, now we need to buy bigger popcorn machines because we can't handle with all the demand. So, and, and we need foreign currency to go to Namibia and buy the machine. So could you help us? So we figured out a plan, but a few weeks later, they called me again. I went and said, forget, we built our own machine. So they managed to build by their own a big popcorn machine. So they, that now their productivity improved. They started building more selling carts and things just went bigger and bigger. Now they're even selling eggs in, in their carts and, and the business is growing and I love to see that. So I think this answers your question. Yeah, yeah, it, it does. And at the same time, it sounds to me like it needs the spark of inspiration yeah. and so this thinking of, okay, how can I actually dream this bigger or go bigger? So yeah. my point of view also to adding what Aron just said, to, to, to youngsters here. And that's what we do because every now and then we, we have a few, I wouldn't say disciples, but people want to get some experience, to get some help and advice. Uh, but one of the advices is so is that when you come in here alone, just you're a one man show, you know it's going to be harder, you know? And if you get together with like-minded people, you're going to get so much faster. Um, I think in terms of mentality, War has crushed a bit of who can you trust, you know, because if I do this, he's going to steal me. I'm going to can't trust him. I need to be myself and then I'll take it from there. And, and, and for me, it was actually a turning point. I had lots of uh, business ideas and I tried a few, but while I was just struggling on my own, um, you know, the, the, all the projects, you know, they were like a bit short sighted. It's like, you know, you go in, but you can't because you don't have the time for it, you don't have the means. Just finding people that you know, that can follow you and you can be in the same thing as that's us, you know? We have, know, we have, uh, we are uh, lots of partners and that's it, you know? We, we are on the same page. We, can, we have the same interests, we have the same purpose in life. And that's the thing, try to find people who are in that kind of level of craziness with you. So that's, that's, that's it, you know, I, I, I struggled, I struggled a lot and I, I got my entrepreneurship from my mother, you know, and any, any African mother is an entrepreneur, you know, but not for the, you know, I want to do something all my life. No, it's just to put food on the table. That's the motivation from her that you get, you know, and I, I remember my mother always, you know, when he had a business idea, she would call me and oh, let's do this, probably do that and all that. So it, 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 it becomes you and then you grow and then you, you travel and you go live abroad, but it, it becomes part of your DNA, you know. Uh, but that's it. I was fighting a lot, you know, just I had the craziest business idea, nice and you know, this is going to be bombing and all that. But that's just an idea, you know, and, and I'm only one person, you know. But the thing is that... And, 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 and the thing is that it wasn't on me, you know, that's why I'm saying, I think God chose, you know, put the, the right people at the right moment. And you kind of see, okay, if you find these like-minded people that are crazy as you or, you know, but have a different background, that gets together. Now, that's the aggregator, you know, it, you know and you can be a bigger collective. And, and that's what I tell kids, you know, you come in here alone, man. Just uh, see other people do, they talk, don't be afraid on that one. Uh, you know, that's the thing is taking the fear out of them. And that's what I did. And that's for me, that was my turning point. You know, the point that I just stopped being just a guy with some cool business ideas to a guy. Now we're, we're getting somewhere, you know, and this is the thing is so diverse when you find these people. And that's when the magic starts happening. It's when you get together with other people, like-minded people, people who have the same purpose as you. This to me was my turning point. And well, thank you so much for sharing. Yeah, thank you, man. Thank you guys for being here, for being crazy minded people going on electrical bike <laughs> since Europe. I'm your fan, man. <laughs> thank you so much. Take You're care, welcome. Man. You're welcome, you. man. <laughs>